Thank you, Dr. Perlin, for your kind introduction and a very warm welcome to everyone for the Idea Clinic Endocrine and Diabetes Research Update. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Vidya Tiku to give her talk on management of uh, management with uh, second generation basal insulins. Dr. Tiku has done her medical degree in Pune and uh, she has done her DNB endocrinology in Ashoda Hospital and now she is working as a consultant endocrinologist at Ashoda Hospital High Tech City and Fernandez Hospital, Mayapur. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I'll be talking about uh, the second generation basal insulins. Um, and moving forward, gaining a wider uh, perspective of diabetes management with uh, these insulins. So, uh, as we know, um, earlier, the, when we used to talk about diabetes, we would mainly talk about fasting blood glucose, postprandial blood glucose, and HbA1c. But now, as uh, uh, things are changing, now with CGM, we have a newer concept called time and range. We have uh, better indices to see glycemic variability. And uh, this is uh, the present and definitely the future of diabetes where after maybe five years we have everyone uh, with more affordable CGMs, putting CGM continuously to monitor uh, the blood sugar levels. Also, there are a lot of studies and emerging evidence coming in that uh, says that uh, suboptimal time and range can lead to microvascular complications and mortality. So they say that every 10% decrease in time and range increases the risk of retinopathy by 60%, nephropathy by 40%, peripheral uh, uh, neuropathy by 20%, and also increases the risk of uh, cardiovascular complications and mortality. So what happens uh, when we use second generation insulins uh, like uh, Glargine 300? They have smoother pharmacokinetic and uh, pharmacodynamic profiles. They have injection, injection uh, time flexibility. And in a lot of studies where they have compared first generation to second generation, they have found that it is non-inferior to Glargine. Uh, so as I said, like now beyond HbA1c, we have glycemic variability and time and range which are emerging as uh, the key metrics uh, for uh, the diabetes management. And um, because we know that even if we have an HbA1c of say 6.5, the person can still, our patient can still have hypoglycemias and hyperglycemia episodes. And glycemic variability is basically a combination of these, that is troughs and peaks in uh, blood glucose. And higher this variability, higher are the risk of complications that happen. And uh, they affect uh, obviously the lives of people with diabetes because they lead to micro and microvascular complications. So nowadays, uh, a lot of guidelines have started uh, recommending the indices for time and range and uh, how much should be maintained uh, to have a, a good glycemic control so that uh, they don't end up developing complications. So um, other than time and range, when we look at uh, our uh, CGM recording, we also see uh, things like time below range, time above range, and glucose coefficients of variance, which uh, complement traditional metrics like HbA1c. So these are the, the, the standard recommendations that we say that time and range, we take it as between 70 to 180. And for most of our type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients, we want that this time and range, that is the blood sugar between 70 to 180, should be more than 70% of the time. They should be maintaining this uh, uh, glucose levels more than 70% of the time. The time above 180, that is level 1 hyperglycemia, should be below 25%. And blood sugars more than 250 should be below 5%. Again, hypoglycemias, uh, the, uh, the time that a patient spends in hypoglycemias is even lesser. So it should be uh, just less than 4% below 70 and blood sugar below 54. The patient should have less than 1% of their time in that uh, category. For high-risk individuals with CKD, CLD or older individuals where uh, we want to prevent hypoglycemias at all costs, uh, we reduce this time in range and uh, then the time in range that we want them to spend in that target is just above 50%, whereas more than 150 should be below 50%, more than 250 below 10% and below 70 below 1%. Other than uh, the regular type 1 and type 2, 
um we also have implications of cgm now in uh, pregnant patients so gestational diabetes or pre existing diabetes uh, diabetic patients who get pregnant later and um, they the newer studies are coming that are showing that the more t- uh, uh, time that they maintain in that particular range that we want the lesser are the risks of complications and uh, to both mother as well as neonatal complications later on uh and a lot of other studies are going on in this particular uh, category as well so for type 1 uh, patients who get pregnant uh, cut off for that time and range changes uh, to 63 to 140 and we want them to maintain more than 70% of their uh, blood glucose in this range and less than 25 above 140 less than 4% below 63 and again for gestational diabetes or for uh, type 2 pregnant patients more than 90% of the time should go in that 63 to 140 uh, mg per deciliter range so as i just told that each 10% drop in a time and range is associated with 60% more retinopathy 40% more nephropathy 20% more neuropathy 5% more increased risk of cardiovascular mortality and an 8% risk of all cause mortality and again uh, newer studies are coming uh, like we had age old studies like uk pds dcct newer studies which are going to be studied uh, for years together are uh, going on on this uh, parameter so it can be used for both type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics for type 1 mainly to assess their insulin requirement and to titrate insulin and for type 2 diabetics for a lot of things to choose and monitor their diet we pract- uh, it helps a lot um, for the patient to notice that when they eat this particular diet the glucose shoots up when they eat this particular diet the glucose remains uh, under uh, in in good control so it helps uh, to choose the diet correctly and uh, to get uh, the patient gets the idea exactly why we are telling them to eat something particular to observe the impact of exercise and to optimize our oral drugs or insulin doses so um where we can use if we think that uh, our oral drugs are being inadequate uh, to see if there are fluctuations in the blood sugar levels uh, if if our hba1c and blood sugar levels are not correlating if the patient is having a lot of hypoglycemias which is unexplained or if the patient is at risk of hypoglycemias like autonomic neuropathy ckd uh, help to help them to manage diet uh, and lifestyle and as i told in gestational diabetes also it is coming since uh, we ask our pregnant patients to monitor sugars very strictly and that involves a lot of pricking sometimes just to ease out that process a lot of them do prefer cgm so uh, with time and range it is a simple parameter it is an objective goal we get clear direction and uh, the patient sees uh, the uh, the results there and then so it gives them empowerment in a lot of studies they have found that even if there was no impact in hba1c but uh, there was a positive reinforcement for the patient when they were using cgm because they were more in control of their diabetes at that time so um so basically the difference between first generation basal insulins and second generation basal insulin is that they have a smoother pharmacokinetics and dynamics the second generation ones and that basically leads to uh, lower glycemic variability and nowadays a lot of studies have also started uh, looking at variability and not just uh, hba1c or uh, smbgs which are earlier studies had so in this study uh, uh, the glargine 300 uh, was compared to uh, the first generation basal insulin and uh, that is u uh, 100 and it was a 16 week study in 60 type 1 diabetic patients and uh, the end points were the glycemic variability matrix mean glucose levels and mean change in hba1c and uh, what they found mainly if you can see in the in the graph also the green one is the second generation uh, glargine 300 and the blue one is glargine 100 and uh, you can see the green one is flatter as compared to the blue one so the glucose excursions the highs or lows are fewer with uh, glargine 300 as compared to 100 efficacy wise since they have conducted a lot of trials it is non inferior to u100 that is glargine but uh, the main effect is reducing hypoglycemias especially nocturnal hypoglycemias and there is decrease in uh, glycemic variability so that is the advantage of second generation insulins 
um so another study that they did was to see flexibility so practically if we tell our patient that he has to take only at 9 pm uh, it might not be possible so can it be taken 3 hours before or after so somewhere see uh, 6 pm to 12 pm so they compared uh, the hba1c with flexible dosing 6 hours flexible that is 3 plus minus and a fixed dosing and the hba1c percentage in both the uh, both the uh, flexible as well as fixed was similar and uh, there was no increased risk of hypoglycemia as well so glargine 300 in this study showed that there was a flexibility in timing of the injection um again as i said that the main purpose is that it lowers the nocturnal glycemic variability compared to first generation insulin so another study in which they uh, switched the patients on glargine 100 to toju that is glargine 300 they saw that uh, there was two times decrease in within night glycemic variability uh, with the glargine 300 and nocturnal glycemic variability between the uh, nights was numerically lower with glargine 300 so again a lot of uh, so this was we clearly know that regarding glycemic variability or hypoglycemia second generation insulins are better than first generation but then what about the two second generation insulins so degludec versus glargine 300 again a lot of trials uh, some have favored glargine 300 some have favored uh, degludec a uh, huge uh, more numbers are definitely needed to exactly say uh, the the real scenario so here glargine 300 uh, if uh, they have done a uh, glycemic clamp study and as compared to uh, the degludeg you can see glargine with green line it is the flatter the curve is flatter so there was lesser uh, variability with glargine 300 as compared to degludeg and um, with degludeg there was a 22 percent higher insulin peak as compared to glargine 300 and uh, there was 23% lesser uh, intraday variation with glargine 300 as compared to degludeg. So um, again, another study uh, which was done, it was a randomized crossover study with 30 type 2 diabetic patients, um, f just 30, so 15 uh, on glargine 300, 15 on degludeg crossover. The endpoint was uh, the mean percentage of time within the target glucose range of 70 to 180. So the time in range was comparable between the two, uh, both had similar time in ranges, but uh, the hypoglycemia, especially nocturnal hypoglycemia was significantly low in uh, glargine 300 uh, patients who were using glargine 300. We have to keep in mind that it was done in 30 patients only, so that is a limitation of the study, the number of patients that uh, was studied so but it, it did show significant uh, decline with any time hypoglycemia nocturnal or severe hypoglycemia with glargine 300 so again another study with the flash glucose monitoring in which uh, they have studied type 24 type 2 diabetic patients and uh, measured that as compared to degludeg as corroborating other studies so this was in type 2 diabetics in type 1 diabetics again they have used cgm and seen the time in range again uh, uh, with uh, glargine 300 compared to degludeg uh, they there here they have studied uh, more number of subjects so 100 were receiving glargine 300 and uh, 95 glargine 100 and uh, what they found was that the time in range uh, time above range or below range profiles was similar but what changed was the overall night time uh, levels uh, where people were having hypoglycemias was more in degludec uh, insulin as compared to those who were using glargine 300 again they have compared uh, a fixed uh, premix insulin uh, compared to a basal plus insulin in which they have given basal uh, uh, with glargine 300 and blue lysine as bolus uh, two times a day and what they have found is that time in range was better so uh, with uh, of course there are a lot of other things here it's not a fixed dose so you can always adjust the amount of uh, basal or amount of bolus separately time in range was more there was seven times less risk of hypoglycemia and 18 times less risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia in these patients Another study in type 1 diabetics in which uh, they have measured time and range compared degludec with glargine 300. Uh, what they found here was that uh, basically there was everything was non-inferior. Primary endpoint was glycemic control that is percentage of time and range which was non-inferior. Uh, glycemic variability here in type 1 uh, diabetic patients of uh, uh, glargine 300 versus degludec 
the glycemic variability was also non inferior it was similar between the two and similar occurrences of hypoglycemia were there with no unexpected safety findings so it was non inferior regarding the efficacy as well as safety profile so to summarize uh, glycemic variability and suboptimal time and range can significantly impact the lives of people with diabetes uh glargin 300 allows uh, f a dosing flexibility that is you can take it before 3 or plus 3 hours uh and the hba1c or hypoglycemias don't change so it is it gets easier um, in practical life numerous trials now use cgm and time and range profiles and they have demonstrated that glargin 300 provides effective and sustained glycemic control with lower uh, incidences of glycemic variability and use of glargin 300 is associated with lower incidence of overall and nocturnal hypoglycemia so the main point here is that second generation insulin especially glargin 300 efficacy wise remains similar uh, less glycemic variability less hypoglycemia especially night time hypoglycemias so overall reduction in uh, complications thank you thank you dr vijay for your excellent presentation questions for dr vijay